if the internet actually works. So I got a supply of eight track players from Lebanon at a really good price. Oh my gosh. <laughs> you know, it, suspiciously good price. Yeah, really good. Made by Israel Technologies. It was really weird. I asked the family if they had heard anything about it, and then I found myself describing it, and, bon and, and the kids are like, why are you seeming excited about this? I'm like, I don't know. It's only the most massive moving parts subterfuge of of espionage warfare <laughs> i've ever seen <laughs> like like and it's like well why is that good i'm like i don't know if it is good <laughs> I, yeah like, i'm like i'm like i don't wish i'm not a fan of misery and death and whatnot when it's terrorists i'm not like you know kind of pull down my window and well and like like, like the best <laughs> it's precision and targeted you know it's like wow yeah, I mean, there's the difference between uh, indiscriminate, you know, bloodshed and discriminate bloodshed. And uh, like, yeah, now we're talking about international war crimes and whatnot. I'm like, uh, maybe this is a bit too much to process over chicken nuggets. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh... G. James B. Here's the question to you How do we look? Drum roll. Here, this is the big. We're waiting. Solid. Hey, we're good. Fine, <laughs> All right. Uh, I think we're good. If you want to bring us in, I can catch you in. Okay. All right. Three. Oh, wait. It just started. We just recorded the first. Recording of the new drive. Ready? Three, two, one, and... Hello, and welcome to the Weird Things Podcast. I am Andrew Main, joined by Brian Brushwood. Hello! We have bandwidth now. Mr. Justin Robert Young. Hola. Gentlemen, I would love to order a burrito right now, but I don't want to wait, like, 40 minutes to get here. Oh, okay. Wait, wait, wait I mean... We've Man, all been there. If only, if do you think so? Oh, if only somebody had a three D burrito printer. All right, let's not get crazy here. Yeah, uh, I don't know, or maybe you could call it your kitchen, dude. Like it's not really hard to make a burrito. Oh yeah, I'll just get up and go make a burrito right now yeah. in the middle of this podcast because that's what we do now, Justin. Apparently, the new rules. Only if you I mean, had like a, a life partner that you could call no, upon. No, it's impossible. Where's my tortillas in there, Justin? I just, do you not I live have in California? Tortillas? You just assume I have tortillas in the refrigerator? I mean, we certainly do in Texas. <laughs> well, uh, I would love to be able to have things now. I mean, who wants to wait? Remember when they had like uh, Prime Now when it was like two hour delivery? Yeah, whatever happened have to that. that? Anymore? Wait, uh, wait I, I mean, I just, I, I'd be happy to go back to them ever delivering at the time that they say they're going to deliver. Yeah, well, so obviously in the world we live in, we need things to move faster. It's just not, it's not enough that I have to wait 45 minutes to get a burrito. It's really, it's insane. Who can live with like that? Like, could you imagine our ancestors having to wait that long? Fortunately, there's been some different ways to sort of progress and innovate. One of the things they've talked about is the idea of drone delivery. But one of the limitations of drone drill delivery is that you know, having a quadcopter with a bunch of rotors landing in your front sidewalk or your front porch doesn't sound like the safest idea. But I wasn't aware of this company until recently. Have you guys heard about Zipline? Zipline. Let me look them up. Just Z-I-P-L-I-N-E. Mm -hmm. It sounds familiar. It's It sounds like a, like a drone thing. Yes. So they initially started with actually having airplanes that would fly like, you know, remote controlled planes that could drop like cargo in let's say parts of africa where you needed vaccines or other things and so they started that now they've built this basically a, a multi-rotor copter and what's cool about it if you go to the website you can see the latest version of what they have or you go look on youtube you actually go to youtube to see what they're doing now okay because now what they do is basically imagine a large drone that's attached to like a mast and it has a little cargo pod that comes down so let's say you put one on top of, you know, Subway, right? Inside Subway, they package your sandwich, put it into a bag, drop it in this little thing the size of a large lunchbox. It gets sucked up into the drone. 
drone flies over to your house, but it's like maybe a hundred feet above your house and lowers this thing. They call it like a droid, which is its own little unit that's got little controls to keep it from flying out of position. And that just drops the cargo down and then zips back up into it and goes away. Well, so, uh, uh, so if I'm looking for it on YouTube, uh, uh, I'm seeing a bunch of stuff from a year yeah. or, or farther yeah, back. Yeah, scroll back up, Ryan. Uh -huh. um, see that that main video you see there with the little the weird shuttle thing? That's yeah. it. Okay, there we go. Okay, I see it. So, so it's got wings like a uh, uh, like an airplane. So I guess I guess when it's going fast enough, it's getting some of that um, uh, lift. Uh, but then but then it could just sort of stop with the quadcopter. Right. Yeah. And then and, and then so, drop stuff off and then and then go back. Yeah. So what happens is is that there's a part of it is for the quad the quadcopter version. What they do is basically, uh, I think they have a new some of the newer videos. But yeah, you can see that what they do is it has like imagine a large quadcopter, and then it has this little container that's on a line. You can drop down like a hundred feet, and so just and drop off and then unload a cargo like whatever. In oh, your it's front much door. bigger than than it seems to be. Yeah. Uh, as we've talked about with with UAPs, it's hard to really gauge the size of things in the sky. Um, it it looked like something about a hand span wide, but it's like the 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 cargo appears to be I don't know the size of half a human, maybe bigger. And what can load? It can carry eight pounds. The whole thing is maybe about two meters across, and it, it attaches to these kind of weird looking towers. So their thinking is this: is that like in the morning, these things are on top of Starbucks and other places, picking up things to deliver, fly off, deliver, come back, pick up more cargo. And the afternoon, they just move their fleet over to places that are doing lunch deliveries. In the evening, they're doing pharmaceutical stuff or you know, other kinds of deliveries. So the idea is basically a fleet of these things. And the idea that they figured to solve for the noise problem is the copter never comes down low. The, it stays up in the air pretty high. So you're not hearing the, the big loud noise. And you're also not worried about this thing that's, you know, the size of a, you know, riding lawnmower landing in your front yard because it just mm. stays way above that's brilliant so so it takes advantage of that inverse square law for for the noise yeah because it's not nearly mm -hmm. as loud as you know say a jet engine or what have you but uh uh that's great yeah so kind of a cool cool future so uh, you think that might be used more domestically that's their plan they're rolling it out in texas right now what wow so, I haven't gotten my um my my I haven't gotten whitelisted on the Waymo yet. There's all sorts of cool stuff. Uh, that... wait, uh remind me of what Waymo is. Waymo is is driverless Uber. Oh, that's right. Yeah, they've, they've it's got in that... Austin. Yeah. Wait, you guys have have you guys done Waymo yet? I haven't. I've have not done. I don't no. think I've ever been in a vehicle that self drove. I mean, like, that I know. So of. here's here's the cool thing about Waymo. So you see Waymo all over SF. Like the Waymos are super super dense. They've got lidar all over it. They're there. You see them. You pull out your app. You order Waymo. Go from point A to point B. A um, couple things interesting about a Waymo. You get inside and it's got very soothing music and lights. You you see they've just spent a lot of time thinking about the experience. It feels like an Epcot ride. Mm -hmm. So for the first two minutes, you're like, oh, my God, this car is driving itself. After that, you completely forget, and you're just in a ride. And it's a very smooth ride, very nice. I've been in Waymo several times. You just The amazing thing to me is you just quickly forget because it got, like, bathed in blue light. It just feels different than an interior. And so it's a very, very cool, you know, idea. And it's great for areas where they have the same routes. That's the beauty of, like, Waymo – the the problem Tesla sort of started off with is the idea of like we need to be able to have our car go anywhere and everywhere. Well, the problem with that is that there's all these unforeseen circumstances, shut down roads, things like that, where Waymos have a specific route. They map out the city. They know the route really well. When they run a Waymo service, they actually have people monitoring them so they know where these, you know, where they are. There's construction stuff, whatever. So yeah, you've got Waymo and then you've got also Zooks. You've seen Zooks. I have not seen Zooks. Z uh, 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 Waymo is similarly saturated throughout downtown Austin, but uh, like LA, they are they are rolling out their wait list, whereas Phoenix and SF have Waymo just on demand. You can just uh, you can just download it and 
and and use it because Phoenix is was really leaned into it. They leaned into driverless cars. So I, yes. I uh, oh, go ahead. I, uh, yeah, yeah. So you're looking at Zooks. You want to describe that one now? Yeah, it's it's a lot boxier, which kind of triggered a thought that I had actually this morning. This morning I was driving uh, actually here earlier, and for the first time ever, I saw two cyber trucks within maybe five car lengths away from each other. And it got me thinking about how popular Cybertrucks are getting, and and that had me wondering: is that an Austin thing because Tesla's here, or is that just a um, in general thing? And then the follow-up thought was: I wonder how much longer that that boxy aesthetic will will be in because it is such a striking design. Um, and and I, I then I thought: well, why would you ever get rid of it? Well, you would get rid of it for aerodynamics. I'm like, why? Because that's more fuel efficient. What does fuel efficiency matter if eventually all that energy is clean? Um, and then uh, uh, and then I started to think, okay, go the other way. Uh, imagine what if what you want is efficiency, and I just pictured a bunch of shipping containers driving around and uh, maybe even getting on the highway and sort of um, not physically linking up like a train, but but essentially, you know, having a three foot buffer, all computer controlled, like a train. And I eventually found myself following everything to its logical conclusion, where it ended up um, uh, uh, actually. Uh, I, I, I I was picturing uh, 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 you walking into your office, which is actually a shipping container that actually takes you. Uh, off onto the highway and you don't even notice because you're just working. There's no need for safety belts because everything's computer controlled. You barely notice the motion uh, and you don't really need to look out the window because you're just in the office for an hour and then you're on the other side of town and you walk out into the office. Yeah, I think, I think you know, the idea of an automated future when you, because the Zooks is an interesting idea because it just looks like a thing designed to carry people and they don't, you know, the, the problem they have with Waymo is what problem, but like, Waymo still have a passenger section and a driver's steering wheel, which kind of makes sense now. But if you're thinking, you know, in the future, like, you know, yeah, you're not going to have that in an autonomous vehicle if it's always in an autonomous mode because that's a waste of space. Where Zooks is like, we can make the space interior much bigger, nicer, et cetera. And to your point, like, once you can put anything autonomous on wheels, you can put anything autonomous on wheels. You want to have a tiki bar show up at your house to have a party. Do you put a tiki bar in? A mobile autonomous vehicle we've talked about the idea i think a while ago about like you want to do a burning man and you want to have 500 you know hotel rooms yeah you just have these suckers on wheels and they just show up and get there and you might we might talk about too like maybe just platforms that deliver containers and i think it's a future we're heading to pretty quickly you know well, and, i think for, for, for this stage of it it's very interesting the the two solutions waymo is there to say we can buy these cars stock right and and uh, put things on them that make them ready to be Waymos. Whereas Zooks is like, we're going to build our own specific vehicle and, and probably put them in more uh, strategic places. Yeah, yeah. I could, I so. could picture eventually, you know, the modern home essentially having a dock for a perpetual room. That is the travel room where it's like, Hey kids, we're going to Disney. Don't forget to pack the travel room. And then, you know, uh, y'all go to sleep in the travel room and you wake up most of the way to your destination. Yeah, that future could be today. Hmm. So I think we're moving quickly towards that. Uh, we've been seeing some more, you know, developments with robotics innovation, et cetera. That's been very cool. And uh, you know, uh, Justin and I talked about this before, but Brian, have we had a chance to talk about OpenAI's uh, O1? Yes. Uh, the 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 reasoning one. Yeah. So we're you know getting some more interesting sort of capabilities coming from that. People starting to experience this. And then I saw something, Brian, that we've talked about this idea repeatedly, and there have been versions of this. Uh, social AI, you heard about this? Hmm. Uh-uh. What's it do? I, I feel like we have had two or three bites at this apple, but as AI has gotten better, I feel like the idea continues to come into clarity. And that is, uh, what if you got exactly the experience you wanted out of social media because oh, you yeah, were yeah. the only this, human. This is bring back my botnet where I would post something and the whole world would, would gasp and be excited for me. <laughs> exactly. 
So it's a yet another AI powered social network where basically everybody there is just an AI and then you, and they're telling you, you know, you're great. You're awesome. Uh, so I, I discovered a new use for uh, uh, chatting with chat GPT, chat G. Um, in, I was reading a book that managed to wedge two words that I was unfamiliar with into one sentence, perspicuous and procrustean. Are you guys familiar with either of those words? Yeah, uh, I, I have not. So, oh, so I read it, them, just glossed over them. Uh, when I when I heard them, I mean, from context, it's clear that the guy wanted to uh, uh, make something clear without making it overly clunky, right? So, so within context clues, I got it. But I was like, the heck are those words? So I just asked, what is? I wanted to make sure I was right. So I was like, what is perspicuous? What is procrustean? And uh, and it, it gave me the definition. Pros, uh, perspicuous means clear. Procrustean means wedging something into a rigid structure. Uh, and uh, and then. That would have been the end if it was a dictionary thing. But instead, I was like, where do those come from? And it turns out that Procrustean, Pro, Procrustean was, uh, Procrustes was a, a villain in an ancient Greek myth that's written about by Plutarch. And Procrustes loved having people over at his house, but he was very rigid and insistent that they sleep in the bed that he provided with them. So if, say, their body was too large for the bed, he would cut them off at the shins so that they fit into the bed. Or if they were too short for the bed, he would put them on the rack and, distort, and, and, and torture them to make their body long. And eventually he got got by the hero of the story, and it mentioned casually that it was written about by Plutarch. And I'm like, whoa, is that the same Plutarch that uh, brought us the, way, the ship was, of thesis? Who is, who is the hero? A Yelp review? Uh, <laughs> it was a dude who ironically forced him into uh, the bed <laughs> and killed him. <laughs> ah. uh, it, it was a real goosebumps kind of a <laughs> myth. <laughs> but, <laughs> but the uh, but but because I heard the myth myth, it it really locked in the word and the origins for it. And uh, then I you know tried using it in a sentence a few ways, and I found out that you know, I was like, oh, that's the same Plutarch that brought us the ship of Theseus and so, Theseus and so on. Uh, and then uh, uh, perspicuous is of Latin origin. But basically, like, that's a good habit. And because it's old etymologies, you don't have to worry about hallucination or current facts or whatever. Um, it's uh, for vocabulary. It seems to be excellent for uh, training you on new words. Yeah, I think it's it's amazing to have, you know, something you can have a conversation with, you know, the the joke about homeschooling is it guarantees your kids will be as dumb as you are. <laughs> but with chat GPT and these other models, then you have the capability for them to speak to, you know, a, a system that is incredibly well read and well versed in many different topics. Which yeah. is cool. So, uh, Guys, I want to take us on an expedition into a cave. We're going to go deep, deep into a cave. Okay. And uh, okay. let's start planning. What are we going to bring with us? Well, a flashlight, obviously. Yep. Okay. Uh, pants. Maybe, maybe, maybe okay. uh, uh, an oxygen tank. You know, could, mm -hmm. or a bird in a, a bird in a, a cage. Uh -huh. I'm going to go with uh, shoes. Uh, okay. A, a hard hat. Yeah. yeah. Socks. Uh, some soot in case, you know, uh, my face isn't already covered like a coal miners, then I can make sure to just, not too much because I don't want to get canceled, but but just a little bit of coal on my face. I'm going to go with a shirt. Uh, mm -hmm. a, 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 a tool box, but don't worry about the tools. I, maybe I'll put a ham sandwich in there. I love that Brian has all this stuff, but he's buck naked, and I'm just a regular guy walking into a cave with no supplies at all. Oh, uh, one more thing, a handgun, and that'll take care of the rest. Here we go. Calm down, Madam Vice President. Uh, so, uh, ham sandwich, anything else? Any other, any other food supplies? Uh, well, I guess I would thermos. say enough, enough for us to survive for two weeks. You never know. Oh, and a... a, 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 a a a uh, uh, air horn in case we we get caught and we need help. Okay. How about some snacks? Any Cheetos? Yeah. Um. I think what what do you think? I mean, Onions, Brian? Oh, I'm thinking more like beef jerky. You know. Oh yeah, let's do beef jerky. That's rich, rich in protein. Yeah, so more no filling. Cheese. No, no, no. Well, the problem with with chips is that they might get crushed. 
we put them in our bags. Next thing you know, the bag goes against the wall and it's got a bunch of dust. Who wants that? Oh, that's, that's that's true, too. It's not the only problem. Apparently, an absent-minded tourist left a bag of Cheetos deep inside the Carlsbad Cavern. Okay. Oh, that's... Uh, look, man, take nothing but pictures. Leave nothing but, uh, I don't know, Cheetos. part of your soul. <laughs> Cheeto bags. This, but the National Park Service made a stern warning because... The bag was dropped in the big room, the largest single cave chamber in America, which takes a long time to make its way through. Left to fester in the pits of the cave, the bag of cheesy snacks sent a tiny shockwave through the local ecosystem. This is from iflscience.com. Uh, quote, the processed corn softened by the humidity of the cave formed the perfect environment to host <gasps> microbial life and fungi. Cave crickets, mites, spiders, and flies soon organize into a temporary food web, dispersing nutrients to the surrounding cave formations. Mold spread up higher, nearby surfaces, fruit die and stink, and the cycle continues, NPS said. At the scale of a human perspective, a spilled snack bag may seem trivial, but in the life of the cave, it can be world-changing. Yeah, dude. Think about that entire cave and the number of calories, like units of energy that once bought a time were, you know, forged in the fusion of the sun— and now, you know, through life cycles are in a bag of Cheetos, the number of calories, what, a uh, thousand X, 10,000 X, a million X inside that space? Good Lord. Yeah. So, uh, just don't guys, just don't bring it in there. What also brings up questions why people worry about, like, if we find life on Mars, and that's why there's the idea that if we find life on Mars, it's cool, but it's also diminishes the prospects if we want to try to go, you know, colonize Mars. It does. It, it actually makes it just a full on non-starter because there's um, and I know I mentioned this a million times, but uh, there, there was a faction in Kim Stanley Robinson's Red Mars, Green Mars, Blue Mars, where it's like the geologists were uh, almost like environmentalists where they're like, humans are ruining all these cool geologic formations. Won't you protect them? They're so rare. And then and then meanwhile, the terraformers are all like, what's the point of this place if we can't give it a makeover? Uh, and uh, it, it, the moment, at least that is kind of a morally ambiguous discussion, whereas the moment life is in there, that truly is extraordinary and should be preserved, and humans should not go there and, and, and muck it up. Yeah, I mean... I guess. <laughs> unless unless it turns out to be identical to some boring stuff on Earth, in which case, screw it. Let's eminent domain that sucker. Uh, it's, it's a mixed bag. You know, like, there's there's pro and con to all. Yeah, it, it is a thing where that that's the one of the arguments for why, like, we have a run into aliens is that as you're able to build a more precise and complex and sophisticated society and solve for a lot of your needs, you find ways to have much lower impact and don't want to have a lot of impact on other things. And I you know end of the day, you just sort of like, you know, you're, 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 you find other ways to sort of explore without ways that we would detect or know. That we're you know, I, well, we could certainly explore it. Uh, we probably would like hyper sterilize robots and, and have a, uh, you know, kind of, uh, synthetic, uh, perfectly sterile uh, Android uh, proxies walking around on there or something, uh, at least for a yep. while until we decide, screw it, let's move in. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it kind of comes down to like the question of is that is that we we use robotics to explore for a couple of reasons. One, it's just it's cheaper. It's just it's really it's the cheapest way to explore, right? Cheapest and safest. And but when it comes to the amount of data, even people who run like Pathfinder and some of the Mars Surveyor will tell you that a human would get you way more data. You know, and people are like, oh, we get send robots. Like, no, like a human, a geologist in a really good spacesuit walking around can collect way more samples, do way more stuff. For now, robots will eventually get better, but but robotic technology isn't there yet. But when it does get there, when you're able to like, you know be able to send up, you know, the fact that helicopters work on Mars still blows my mind. I understand the physics of it, but holy crap, helicopters work on Mars. And <laughs> when you can start collecting tons of data, you then go, okay, why do we want to go there? One reason is to go there is to, you know, make, you know, is to the e increase our odds of survival, big asteroid impact, whatever. But if your goal is exploration, you know, we use space telescopes, you know, the biggest, one of the problems, with the James Webb Space Telescope, it's going to have more data than there are astronomers to look at that data. 
Uh, seems like uh, if only we had a uh, little help from generative AI. <laughs> um, yes, and I talked to one of the lead people working on analyzing that data and the state of their AI tools to look at this stuff. Not great. Not great. And and because it's it's a matter of funding and whatnot. And it's just it's like you're like, oh, because they mentioned like, yeah, we built this project to do this. I'm like, why don't we do that? Well, number one, we didn't think of that. Uh, number two is, you know, well, think about it. Number two was dot, 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 hint, hint. The first thing we did was literally I had a grad student who knew how to code and who built that thing for me. You know, and so well, and much of a lot of science is just somebody had the spare time. There, there is a point where, uh, however much they've done with their AI, um, uh, it might be worth it to just scrap all that's come before and start today, square one, working with the most advanced AI to write the most advanced AI for it. Because ju uh, just the tools have accelerated so much. I think you might be onto something, Brian. I think that is the... the <laughs> You know, I've been working with a group that's doing biological stuff, and I've started looking at a lot of the tools that were around there and realized that, holy cow, a lot of these things are uh, felt like they're built in the 1990s and just run on top of JavaScript. And, uh, you know. Yeah, we, well, uh, uh, the reason uh, I was thinking about it is in real life, we, we, had, uh, we got dropped by it turns out that Houston gets hit by too many hurricanes for our insurance company's taste. So they dropped all of Texas. And so, we, you know, I was obsessed with, okay, what did we used to have so we could get an equivalent one with a different company? And Bonnie was just like, just call the new company, describe everything we have and just get everything covered. And she ended up being totally right. And I was dumb to even try to focus on the legacy of what came before. It's like, all that really matters is get covered now, go. Yeah. Yeah, sunk cost fallacy, man. That's like it should be a whole podcast because it is just the 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 bane I know of my existence is that I often just spend so much time kind of going over the same thing again and again. And really, what I need to do is just start off fresh. I mean, but, I do a podcast series about it, but I've already put so much into everything else. It'd just be a waste of time. That's a fair point. It's a totally fair point. So, um, you know, what can be done? Uh, I, I feel like hear... I feel like there's more of a story here. No, I was trying to make a joke about the sunk cost fallacy. Cost fallacy. Yeah, oh, got it. Never mind. Yeah. All right. Uh, <laughs> but uh, that is a thing that you know. I I think about this I, as as I help work on my projects and other people's projects. I think about the idea of what is an AI powered company. What does it mean to build an AI company? And and I had this realization: a big part of your time will be spent building tools. Because really yeah. what you're going to do is you're going to, you, you, you're going to be continuously figuring out things to automate. And the question is, is the automation making you more efficient than it's worthwhile? If you're spending too much time, if you're, if the tools aren't being used or aren't increasing your productivity, then it's not a good thing. And so that's the thing I think about a lot is, you know, right now helping my wife out with a project for hers. I need a lot of data and I'm building tools to make the data and I have to step back and go, okay, how important is that data? Is there another way to do it? Yeah, I mean, I think that's that's the cutting edge. The bleeding edge is trying to figure out where the solutions are a like not only a quantum leap forward from the most uh, advanced version of what we can do now, but also how set it and forget it can it be or like possibly right? Like, is it is it something that can continue to do what you need it to do? You know, I think the 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 goal would be to have these solutions be kind of like you know a. Uh, uh, sim city or something like that where you just like set it's like okay and now here's a factory the factory will just keep kind of making stuff as long as i check in on it every once in a while yeah hey here's a factory a factory for money for us <laughs> patreon.com slash weird things support the show be a friend be our friend and we'll be your friend with a after things podcast that you get before anybody else Head on over there right now, patreon.com slash weird things. So in the world of augmented reality, Snapchat unveiled their entry point into developing an AR world. Did you see their glasses? Uh, no. I mean, this is not the first time they've done glasses, right? Well, remember, they, they, they did the glasses before with the camera. And, you know, the joke was the camera faced the wrong way. Uh, yeah. <laughs> now... Now they've built their own augmented reality glasses. To their credit, they're completely self-contained. 
and they fit. No all supple of woven units. cables. No supple woven cables. Uh, they're doing a developer release, so it's like a hundred dollars a month or something as a developer to, to to use them. They don't look horrible. They I mean, they they, they bit... definitely look like a piece of equipment, but not like they they uh, smaller than ski goggles. Um, yeah, you look like you just walked out of Avatar Two and forgot to return the glasses. Yeah, they the 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 problem is this probably a couple fold is that they go do the demo and Spiegel demonstrates it. They've got a forty five degree field of view or smaller. So what you're back at is sort of that hollow lens that very narrow field of view in front of you, so it's not immersive. When it is not an immersive field of view, it is a very different experience, and when it gets clipped off the edges, the illusion gets destroyed, and you watch the demo, and it's very clear he's trying not to, you know, pivot too far away from what they're mm -hmm. looking at, but when they do, and you just see things get cut off, clipped off the field, be like, this is not ready for prime time. This is just not, you. that is the problem you need to solve. That is really like, like, Getting fitting the whole thing on your head with no dangling cables, great. But the moment I just move my head an inch to the right and the edge of the game, the thing I'm playing is cut off, but I can still see the rest of the environment around me. That's just not good. Yeah. Uh well, but, and, and especially it just has to be like the 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 mushy middle that we've been living in with AR for a very long time is that it needs to be useful. Yeah. Like if if it's going to be there all the time, it needs to be something that you are uh, very very excited to interact with. And you know, if we go back to again one of the greatest bait and switches in technological history, the Google Glass demo, that was exciting because in welcome a world, to the new Justin Robert Young show. We're not bitter. I <laughs> know, but but I mean, like in in a world where uh, uh, smartphone technology was where it was at that time that was a very interesting and cool idea and it was something that you'd be excited to use everybody can understand walking through uh, uh needing directions to go someplace and it would be cool if it flashed right in front of your face instead of having to look down uh the problem with almost everything that's happened in ar is that there's nothing that hasn't been just a gimmick that you're going to kind of use once that isn't easier to do on another device be it a watch or a phone which currently exists and has battery that you can interact with it at, at, at all times and that's that's really where you know there's there, there's the one there's the tech the technological side of doing it but really the practical version and that is something that you have to solve for if these things are going to cost a lot of money which we have seen consistently nothing has broken through on that these things are always going to be pretty prohibitively expensive they got to be useful. We, we are living in an era where anything has to be something that you will use immediately and like it's going to make your life better. Yeah, in the, the demo, you'll notice one is we're only seeing kind of like a you're not actually seeing what the viewer sees. You're seeing the field of view within the field of view. Um, you also notice they're not even bothering with occlusion. So if you put your hand up in front of something like the Apple Vision works on basically superimposing your hand over the object by like creating a, you know, which takes a lot of processing, but it makes it more cool because now my hand is not behind the object in front of it. The utility thing, like it's absolutely true. I, you know, I kind of joke that like Google Glass felt like Larry Page getting frustrated that he's asked to make eye contact with people in meetings. And he's like, can you just build me something for it? I'm like, what if we gave you a pair of glasses so you could look at your phone while staring at people? And he's like, yeah. here's a billion dollars, make it happen. <laughs> And I want people parachuting. What? Just, just do just it. Just do it. And they did it. And boy, did they do it. <laughs> but, you know, they're you know, it's now an enterprise. Now that's the whole. You know, we're, oh, we're looking worry. for it's enterprise. enterprise. It's enterprise. Yeah, enterprise yeah. applications. Because you see them all the time at businesses. You see them. Yeah. You know, you see them at businesses all the time, everywhere, everywhere at businesses, every frame. Uh, every frame. Yeah, I, I, I don't know. I, I, the the good news about our era is that tech, technology is so woven into what we do and so commoditized and cheap that we are constantly have we constantly have our lives made easier and better and we can replace things so incremental progress can happen often 
The bad news is for emergent technology is that there's a pretty large barrier to clear to make something worth it. And, you know, I, I still think, you know, I think I'm on my fourth or fifth Apple watch. Like if you don't use fitness tracking, I still don't know exactly how much it's a useful item. Like it, it, it if anything, it almost, uh, is, you know, I, I've always said that that a, a, a smartwatch is about as useful as, uh, you know, you looking at your phone without unlocking it. If you get a lot of use out of that and you would like it closer to your face, then a, a smartwatch is good, unless you're doing sleep tracking, unless you're doing fitness tracking, at which point it's it's really, really good. Uh, well, we, uh, we've talked about this before. I do feel like there's a tremendous benefit, uh, not to the Apple Watch, because the Apple Watch, you, you have to physically uh, indicate to the whole world around you that you're looking at your watch, whereas um, uh, some of the other ones, you can hear based on uh, the custom thumping, you can know what kind of alerts coming in without ever breaking eye contact with someone. And you can wait for- That happens for, on the Apple Watch. Um, uh, yes, however, if you want to see it, you cannot just look your eyes down and and uh, catch the thing uh, at a later time. Uh, you must do the press release announcement that I am checking my watch, uh, which which is always which ultimately was a deal killer for the Apple Watch for me. No, it it it'll flash when it first when it first goes. when it first comes on. But yeah. but if you want to wait 30, 40, 50 seconds a minute. Uh, to before finally it's appropriate for you to glance down and not move your hand at all, you can't do that. And and that was uh, socially uh, uh, the thing I liked the most about, uh, I don't like to telegraph to people as I'm talking to them that a distraction has happened and I'm checking the distraction. And so uh, uh, I, I've not been a fan of how unsubtle the the ui is on on that that might be the only phase in your life somebody who has answered every spam phone call he has ever gotten while we are hanging out <laughs> yep. I, I i i do think that yeah that is the issue because i remember like just stealing a glance at my watch just because notification, I always get that. Oh, yeah, it won't be long, and I'm like, it is. It I, is a net negative. That, yeah, you are. I mean, no matter what, it is an absolute net negative to 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 have so much stuff blipping your wrist and and you having to check in on it, Brian. I I, I do totally agree that it is. It is. If I were around more people, I would probably think more about it. <laughs> it is only because I live a fairly cloistered life and talk to the same. You know three people in person every single day now four that i have a daughter <laughs> like that's pretty much it and she doesn't even know what time is so she's she's a long way away from being offended by me looking at my watch i was at a party the other night and i talked to somebody who's worth a company um let me pull them up let's see if i can see how much of what they're doing is nudge um they're working on their own uh nudge.com they're working on their own brain interface and they're using ultrasound hmm. and so right now they're just using it for very simple applications which is the idea that you know press a button to make yourself go to sleep boost your focus whatever but they are trying to work on like deep brain kind of stimulation in there because they basically they can use like phased array whatever but you can also you know basically part of the idea behind that is that you can stimulate certain parts of the brain and there's a limit, you know, we talked about the limits of like what you can do to sort of signal in the brain and even the province, like, you know, the Neuralink has problems like Neuralink is a neat conceptually neat idea, but they put all these little gold threads in there, but like your brain moves around inside your head. Your brain is just not this just static thing. Otherwise, you know, Aaron Hernandez would be a model citizen. So what happens is that, you know, you have these things that go in there and kind of get, can get pulled out, you know, and, Trying or, to or find misaligned yeah 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 uh so. well and then that's that's where you get into uh, uh transcranial electromagnetic stimulation where uh, in theory you know you just start constantly peeking at the moving target of the brain and using um uh, uh I, I believe it's interference patterns you you stimulate with massive amounts of magnetism various parts of the brain right they and they they tried to evolve from that here by basically making something that's portable by just using sound so this is another form of transcranial stimulation. So um, 
And you know, it's 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 interesting because you do think about that. Like, how do you how do you get the data into the brain or out of the brain? And you know, you we you know, one approach is we'll just hardwire stuff into the brain. I, I certainly think for people who are dealing who are dealing like physical impairments and stuff, I you know, I get it. I get I get you know well, that that might seem to be impactful, but. I, uh, um, uh, uh, I, I got a question for you, uh, for the panel. Um, uh, I, I think this will happen. I don't know when, but I was thinking about, um, if, if anybody out there has read, uh, both Ender's Game and the trilogy that takes place with Ender as an adult, there was one sci-fi gizmo that I, I, I haven't seen in too many sci-fi things outside of it, but it was the idea that he had essentially a it's unclear whether it's a robot, it's artificial intelligence that, um, that he could make the motions of talking as though he was talking, but he didn't have to create the vocal cord hum or anything. He could just, you know, shape the words. I, I think it was like sublingual com communication or something. Um, and, uh, basically the AI would hear it as though we were talking. And in an age of LLMs where, people have collected enough whale sounds to create large language models uh, out of whale sounds and so on. I, it seems like, picture a pirate's eye patch that you just wear around your neck that is collecting data, you know, right, right from your trachea, esophagus or whatever, and it just tracks you talking. Maybe there's a, a bunch of calibration paragraphs that you have to say, and at that point, between the, uh, the muscle contractions, it, seems like it should be able to map the shapes you're making with your that in a camera for essentially lip reading like like how far do you think we are from the ability to have complete conversations where all you're doing is mouthing the words of what you're saying and it's able to map your voice onto it and the other person just hears you like it's the middle of a movie playing and you're able to fully talk and they're able to hear you I think part of it comes down to like, I'm sure in a laboratory, I mean, if we're using, you know, fMRI and some other tools, you know, we could probably pick up a lot of that. It depends on how much hardware you want to have around you, you know, picking you up. And also that, that already assumes that you have the, if you already have the capacity for speech to actually stimulate those areas, then, um, it, you know. uh, well, what the question is like, what's the, what's the point of it? And the, the point is to have a conversation any place where, um, there are other people around and you want to be discreet or quiet. Like for example, uh, out of courtesy, uh, uh, we have the, the penetration tester and hacker extraordinaire, uh, deviant all of here. Uh, and during that time, I noticed that he made a habit of doing a lot of text to speech, but always with the phone extremely close and extremely quietly. And uh, I asked him, was that a security thing? And he said, no, 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 I just, you know, I don't want to interrupt other people by shouting at my phone. And for him, it was a matter of politeness. And I would imagine the next step, that's what got me thinking about it, was wondering if the next step would be just complete non, uh, no sound sub sublingual communication. I, I, did, I did see something get surfaced somewhere in my, my social media feed. Yeah. There's Where, a, some researchers at Austin, actually, University of Texas at Austin have built, uh, there's a lot of people doing that, but they built their own, you know, non-invasive BCI for doing this. But oh, they're using like fMRI, I think. Uh, really? Yeah, so they got to put you inside, that's so you got to put you inside of a giant fMRI machine and then like have you think about the thing you're doing and pick up the signals. But that's the hard part is. Oh, so you're going straight from the brain. Uh, I, I, I meant actually uh, shaping the words with your mouth. Right. I guess the point, if you're saying a lot of what you're trying to do though, is some of the sounds of shape of words comes from what your lips do, what your lungs do and your diaphragm and whatnot. And so, um, I don't know. I mean, I'm sure there's probably, probably a lot of areas of research probably look into that. And so like, yeah, like if, if you save the trouble of having to use, like they're basically using an fMRI with a decoder trying to calculate what you're trying to think in your head. Um, but you know, it'd be interesting too, to think about like, if you could teach yourself braille and be able to use some part of your body to, you know, talk in braille without being consciously, you know, mouthing the words too, or Morse code. Yeah on the top of your palate, but mm -hmm. you know, the problem, I mean, these things just move so fast. 
So the way they learned to fa have people like figure out their speech is they had people, uh, three volunteers required to lie in a scanner for 16 hours each listening to podcasts. And the decoder was trained to match brain activity, meaning using a large language model. Uh, there was a GPT-1, goodness gracious me. Uh, and so they're just trying to figure out the patterns and predicting what your brain was doing at the time. And then, you know, looking at the text and seeing like what, what was firing in your head. And that's one of these things too, you look at this where you find out some of this research is using really old technology, you know, that, that, you know, man, if we can boost that up, you know, imagine what we could be capable of. Yeah. Cool. Well, gentlemen, let's do some picks. Heck yeah. Oh man, I guess uh, uh, I, I wish I had more than The Wire season two as I continue my rewatch. Uh, it's it's an old friend. Where are you at? The controversial season, The Wire season two, as it uh, changed a lot of the cast of characters away from the street level action that captivated so many to the docks of Baltimore. What is your what is your what is your feeling on season two? Uh, it it um uh I I'm at the lull right before. Well, I mean I guess it's I'm pretty much through it. Um, I I I wish I could say it's much maligned, but I would say of the five aspects of Baltimore that get covered one per season, ugh, it's probably the least interesting. It has the least new colorful likable characters uh, ziggy is certainly a colorful character but not but but he's eminently punchable. controversial controversially yeah. colorful just so punchable just so punchable uh but uh um look let me put it this way very excited for the best of all the seasons season three coming around coming up i uh, i agree with you season three is the best season i think anybody who thinks the, the season four the season four people get out of here come on season three is the best all your favorite characters are in it um the I like season two though, mostly because the people that I was the most captivated by are the uh, uh, the larger drug connect characters. Those are the characters that I really, really liked. And those really come to the fore in season two as you are dealing with how drugs get in to Baltimore to it, begin with. It is surprising and fun to see like Proposition Go Bro, uh, <laughs> Proposition Joe, Joe uh, go from a one note foil in season one to he's like, hey, I see an opportunity for a collaboration here with Stringer Bell and stuff. Um, you know, this begins the fleshing out of all the pieces of the puzzle. But there's some so many uh, spoilers incoming. There are so many bummers in season two. Uh, D'Angelo going out the way he did. Um, uh, investing in so many of the dock workers, just see them yanked from relevance. Uh, uh, watching McNulty spend the majority of the season just spiraling and destroying himself because he's not on a real case. It's just uh, just lots of bummers in there, you know? Is season two the, the one with the intro, the pre-credits intro with McNulty just on, like, the bender of all benders that ends up in the diner? Yes, yes. Where he asks, uh, where, where he asks, what, what, what do they got? And she says, hey, you, you can have anything you want. Hard cut. cut. To, yes. Yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah. That's that was like one of the things where you know when I was watching the most recent se two seasons of The Crown, they cast McNulty, the actor from McNulty, as Prince Charles, and I'm like, get out of here! Like, I <laughs> stop it. They like this is. McNulty, and that's that's the intro, the intro where it's like even at his most rot bottom, and and they they go out of their way. This is a for a, 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 a look. It's old enough that you should have seen it by now. The intro to the episode is him going on such a bender that he drink he drunk drives, crashes his car, and then is fascinated about where his car ended up, <laughs> and so like a detective tries to get the trajectory right and then tries to run his car back into the pole the same way to see if he can get it to where it is before he's beat all to hell ends up in this diner and winds up having sex with the waitress because he's mcnulty and his raw sexuality will conquer all that's not prince charles prince charles <laughs> is not that dude get out of here netflix i'm sorry uh i just watched the forgotten with dominic west by the way um, mm. which yeah another uh, J McNulty adjacent character because he plays you remember the forgotten with Julianne Moore 
I don't. The, the woman, she's grieving for the loss of her child, and then they're like, well, you never had a child. You oh, know? yeah, on the plane, never, right? Yeah, yeah. And then, uh, yeah, Dominic West plays this father, this former hockey player, and he plays that character really well. So I'd say he's one of these British actors that's a victim of being so good at certain kinds of roles that you're like, hey, uh, you know, what, you know, who, wait, who, wait, now I'm supposed to believe you're British? <laughs> and I'm yeah. like, well, I have been all along. You know? well, uh, speaking of which, season two is also where he's trying to uh, get in and break apart the brothel. And so they decide he should try on a British accent. So you have a British actor doing a Baltimore accent, trying to do a British accent. <laughs> yeah, It's amazing. Yeah, he's certainly uh, one of these actors just realize how capable he is. I'll tell you, all right, so since we're on the classic HBO train, I watched the first episode of The Sopranos. Ooh, does it hold up? Yes. Yes, it holds up. Shoot. You can understand why that show immediately hit. Number one, the cast is just amazing. They're still, to this day, uh, it, it's just one of those accept no substitutes, like, the characters are just you're just happy that they're in your lives like they're they're just such a, a full and rich uh, uh uh and fully realized and so the intro i mean and obviously the 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 premise of the sopranos is you know what would happen if one of the characters from goodfellas or these scorsese movies went to therapy and and that's where we begin it's his relationship with uh, Dr. Melfi as he has had panic attacks, Tony Soprano. And, uh, you know, he has to live a little bit of this double life where he is a, a baby boomer that is more in touch with his feelings as opposed to the older generation before him. So he is going to a therapist when his doctor, doctor recommends it to him, but he has to keep it secret because if you are in the mob, you can't be thought to be, you know, soft. Uh, have a, have a, you know, crazy. So, uh, it's it's so great, uh, and and you you can tell rewatching it, you're like, wow, like nobody's really come close to doing it. I watched it because when I went to HBO Max for something else, they have the Penguin as like, don't come coming this Sunday, the Penguin, which is in the Batman universe, and it's all stylized in red and black, which you know, like there, it, it is a crime show. It's it's very much going for a Sopranos, but in Gotham City sort of idea. And so I'm like, well, what if I just rewatch The Sopranos? Wow, it's amazing. It's so good. I I got, I don't think I finished the first season of Sopranos. It wasn't for lack of interest, whatever, just kind of got distracted. I did think it was interesting, like, the show got sold on the conceit of, you know, a, a gangster going to a therapist. You yeah, know, and you realize quickly that that's really how they do out the show. Sold. Chief's a character, but it's really we want to do a gangster show. The only way HBO is going to let us do this is if we say, "Ah, what if we go to a therapist? We know what goes on in his head and whatnot." It's like, well, it's you know, gangster stuff. <laughs> you know? Well, also, um, and you can tell it's like, all right, how do we do the Scorsese voiceovers? in an interesting way and so it's like those classic scorsese like like uh those were the days frankie two times was at the pool hey tony like they, and they do a, like like that two or three times but instead of it just being a voiceover it's him talking kind of in code to his therapist of like you know we had a board meeting right and all of a sudden they're punching somebody it's uh i mean it's 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 good and yeah melfi is a character that was similar to Ziggy in, in The Wire, controversial because you, you eventually realize, like, no, you really care about Tony and the mob and the family and, and everything else sort of, including his real family, sort of, like, falls by the wayside, except for Carmela, who's always... I mean, Edie Falco is just such an amazing actress that you can't help but... And even, like, the few moments she gets in the pilot uh, is just, like... Yeah, he's about to go into the MRI after he has the uh, uh, panic attack, and he's just like, you know, like Carmela, it just made me think of, you know, how how precious our family is, our marriage, and it just the 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 disgusted look on her face, <laughs> <laughs> like, okay, whatever. It's just he's great. The show's so awesome. Yeah.
enjoyed it. I watched a movie I hadn't seen in forever, and it's not a uh, not what I would call a like perfect movie, but it's certainly a a. In, I enjoyed it. It's one of those movies like yeah, every six years, you know, I can go watch this movie. Um, did you guys ever see The Eagle with Channing Tatum and Jamie Bell? No, not me. Was that the one with the in they had to remake the plane in the desert? No, that that was Flight of the Phoenix, I think, or yeah. oh. different bird. The, yeah, this is the one where Dennis Channing Quaid. Tatum plays a uh, a Roman officer. Oh, the Roman to, one. There yeah, you get you get sent to Britain and has a conflict, and then he has this grudge on his shoulder because his father had died and gone missing under mysterious circumstances and lost this Roman eagle, this this gold emblem of the Roman Empire. It was a, you know kind of just a big loss on the family. And so uh, the eagle is about him deciding he's going to go try to go get it. And it's a very it's a smaller scale, like Roman epic kind of story. It's literally like him and his slave, Eska, played by Jamie Bell, on this mission to go get it. Um, so I, I think it's an interesting movie. I will say that it, it's it, it, you know for people to like it or get it or into it, like I kind of get it also too. Uh, it's based on a series of books and. Um, I think that um, uh, I guess there's also they did an earlier version of this. There was a British series called The Eagle of the Ninth, which they'd been based upon. It was directed by Kevin McDonald. I will say it's interesting in it. Uh, there is no female characters in it at all. Other than background, there is like not a single speaking part by a woman in it, which I thought was kind of like a an interesting sort of I get making a small scale movie, but you know to kind of like like you know. Now we're, you know, not a... So it didn't, didn't, didn't pass the Bechtel test, huh? <laughs> well, I don't know what test that is, but I mean, I don't know how they're here, but like, it was like, it was very, uh, at least they weren't talking about a guy off screen. Yeah, um, and that's they true. solved it by not doing it. So it was, I would say, I was the, I was like, huh, this is a, I like I've ever seen, you know, uh, some quite like that. But I, I, you know, other than that, you know, oversight, uh enjoy it uh it's kind of fun i like you know i like other stories about kind of roman empire stuff besides the sort of like the the, the bigger one the sort of a smaller scale story but that's not my pick what my your pick, pick is uh if you imagine beetlejuice 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 the first beetlejuice and beetlejuice beetlejuice being the first half of the movie and the second beetlejuice being the second half of the beetlejuice movie beetlejuice okay beetlejuice really fun so uh, Beetlejuice, Beetlejuice, kind of slow start. And then when it becomes a Beetlejuice movie, it's maybe not as long as I'd like it to be, but really loved it. And Michael Keaton is, it's Michael Keaton. Just doesn't miss. So, the uh, man doesn't miss. Uh, early, I, early, he's amazing. Middle, he's fantastic. Late, he's finishing like nobody's ever finished before. Michael Keaton, maybe the greatest American actor. Yeah. A hundred percent. You mean Michael Douglas? Uh, yeah. The uh, 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 so so the first Beetlejuice sort of ends with just this weird curveball, like oh, by the way, all around the world, living and dead people live in harmony now. Just just but a little P.S. there at the end of the first movie. Uh, I guess that conceit goes into the second movie. Like, I is don't it, remember that from the first one. Are you kidding? Uh, uh, there's living people reading a book titled "The Living and the Dead: A Guide to Coexistence," and and the joke is uh, uh, Jeffrey, what's his name? Uh, 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 Principal Rooney says uh, this thing reads like a stereo manual, just like they said with the, like your guide to being dead. So <laughs> the implication being that now living and dead people are all living in harmony, so much so that they have a book on how to get along and make this work. Yeah, yeah. I guess I thought that was just to that house or something, but yeah, um, it, it it picks it up at a very in a kind of a place where you spend the first half of the movie is the trajectory of the people who they became and what after the fact. And then Jenna Ortega, her character and whatnot. Um, I, I listen. You got William Defoe playing a uh, afterlife detective actor. He was actually not. A, he's an actor who played a detective, and in the afterlife, he is still an actor playing a detective. But he's the detective running around and reading from cue cards and stuff. There's a lot of just fun stuff in there. But that's fun. The but and Michael Keaton's just amazing. It's Michael Keaton, um, which. The the thing that I did like about the Flash movie was we got a revisit from a, a Michael Keaton as Batman and like 
Hey, uh, Universal DC, excited about Matt Reeves, what he's doing, Penguin, his Batman series. But I swear to God, if you do a full-on Michael Keaton Batman real sequel to the 1989 Batman in the way you do Top Gun Maverick, because I wasn't a big fan of the 89 Ma- Batman, but I love Michael Keaton, I love Batman. By God, all the money's yours. Yeah. All the yeah. money's yours. I mean, I, you, I'd be... I, 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 I read a thing about when, when they were doing press for the new Beetlejuice that... Uh, really the the original character in the first movie was almost entirely keaton that initially in the script be, the beetlejuice character then spelled like the astron the, the the astronomical term and not the the way that it's styled now uh was just like this vaguely turkish uh character that showed up and he was just kind of he was a little bit more evil and dark uh, uh in in the initial script and keaton was cast and didn't really love it and so he asked tim burton if he could take like a spin on it but like a lot of what you see like he took over that shoot so much that they had to just edit the movie around him like and and that character but he came up with the voice he came up with the 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 jokes uh uh he even came up with the hair he apparently was like screwing around with how he wanted it to look but it was like almost entirely keaton like like that a lot of what was in there was not in in the script he he basically took it over uh one of the writers larry wilson was my wife's screenwriting teacher that's oh, really? amazing yeah neat guy um yeah i i yeah you you look at that and you look at like keaton's like a great actor they do a you get a backstory by the way of where beetlejuice origin of it um, which is funny because he starts to speak in Italian and it's like an Italian movie plays out and it's and you're like, I want more of this. <laughs> I want, you know, I want there's like, you know, it's just his his he is fascinating. I mean, so. you know, I I remember I was very much in the demo for the Beetlejuice cartoon. That was huge. You know, I, I used to watch that all the time. Like that is such a fertile world. And I I was thinking about it with the Agatha show, which we watched the first two episodes last night, and there's just like in that realm of PG-13 horror that's, like, creepy but mostly creative, like, where Beetlejuice, I think, like, defines. Like, that is, like, like the the coolest thing about it is that it's, it's fast, it's funny, it's creative. It's a little spooky, it's a little macabre, it's a little weird, but it, it always is surprising. Like, I don't know, I, I kind of... I wonder why we don't see more of it, except the what, fact what, that it's probably really hard to do because you have to write really good stories and good characters. Well, and mean, also having Michael Keaton helps. Wednesday. Uh, Wednesday was, yeah, Wednesday was good. Did, did I guess, you, and now is the time to do it because genre stuff is like really, really hot. Did, did you guys ever see the 1993 movie of Shakespeare's Much Ado About Nothing with Michael Keaton in it? No. Um, uh, I don't know if you guys will be able to hear this because sometimes audio doesn't play over the Google Hangout, but but let me let me see if this plays and at least the home audience can hear. He does the Beetlejuice voice, but is talking Shakespeare. True. Hold on, this is other people are happening. Being chosen for the Princess Watch. This is your charge. Oh no, he gets more into it later. Did any man stand in the Prince's knee? How is she wounded? Yeah, yeah. It, the, his character is kind of madcap like Beetlejuice. It was like the closest I've ever seen him get to that Beetle, Beetlejuice uh, uh, gravelly voice uh, insanity. Cool. He, 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 Michael mm-hmm. Keaton's awesome. Yeah, yeah, you mentioned Michael Douglas. So I had a uh, math, had a math teacher, Mr. Drapella, who grew up with Michael Keaton's family. His, his bro- knew his brothers. He's staying out with his brothers. And I remember, you know, the teacher Trapella being like, you know, Michael Douglas, what about Mikey? You know, Mikey now he's Michael Keaton. You know, like like he's just he's Batman. Like, like, like who would have thought? <laughs> you know, it's just that's amazing. Yeah. Gentlemen, it's been weird. Got it. Let me real quick just double check that this got recorded because I put it on the new drive. And it did. Cool. All right. Uh, you guys want to go on break for just a bit, or how are we on time? Yeah, that'd be great. I'm good. Okay, cool. Here, I'll be right back. Grab a snack.
Yeah, the gerb stands alone, baby. Finally, cut out all the dead weight. Uh, oh, here we go. Yep. All right, go ahead. Any questions? I haven't streamed in a while, so maybe now you guys have questions for me now that I've made myself more scarce. <laughs> yeah, precious resource now. The gerbs. Huh? Huh? Uh, have I been pooped on yet? uh yes i just came in at the wrong time <laughs> yes yes uh, uh that that'll happen you know they are little babies they don't know they know not what they do but uh we um i think we made a great decision to invest in a lot of uh puppy pads that we put on our changing table which makes any of those accidents a lot easier to deal with than they would have otherwise. Is the baby still very cute? The baby is adorable. Uh, she is just now getting into uh, high contrast images, and she is very fascinated anytime I bring her under a light source. She <laughs> she looks like a, uh, a a dude who's peeking at the uh, uh, the uh, oh. What what are the the like dark side of the moon visualizations at the uh, at the planetarium what, at the planetarium? Yeah, so she just has that face, like like as if somebody's at the dark side of the moon, high on acid. And she sees like a light, and she's just like, whoa, <laughs> whoa, dude, what's going on with that light? Wow, man, wow, it's pretty amazing. All those little neurons firing, just trying to make sense of all this stuff. Just it's it's awesome. It is it is truly amazing to see everything uh, come on online. Cool. All right, you guys good? Yep. All right. Three, two. Hello, and welcome to the After Things podcast where we talk about things but when nobody knows also no, what I, I, who, I, who it, is it, this it's not called before things <laughs> it's after. We'll spoil it justin fine uh <laughs> so you know we're all creative professionals trying to figure out our way through being an independent which means um having to take on a lot of challenges and stuff that you don't often get when you sort of follow a more traditional career path and it comes with its ups and its downs but ultimately can be pretty rewarding and so the whole purpose of this is just to talk about that and give our insights into that and mm -hmm. you know i've been talking about as i use ai to go do stuff and how much of what i've been doing now is like been building tools and you know building tools to use tools to use tools which could be a bit addictive but I think there has to be sort of a healthy way to sort of stop and say, okay, what do I need to get done? Is this something I can automate? Because if I spend a couple hours figuring out how to automate it and I never have to worry about it again, then that's cool. If I try to automate it and I'm always working on that tool, then that's not good. So, you know, when, when, when we used to uh, be, be working uh, back in Florida, you always had a, uh, a, a cautionary tale that was told to you about the, the pen factory. Oh yeah, Adam Smith and the Pen Factory, uh, which is that you you don't want to have a workflow that 
takes so much personal effort that you're never really able to grow. Like you are just filling your filling your day with work that is is not uh, uh, additive, right? Is there is there a better way to put that? Yeah. So it was a story told by Adam Smith, which which may have been apocryphal or may have been told by other economists, but he he describes the like it was in Scotland or Northern England. It was this a uh, man and his two sons who made pens, little pens, you know, for sewing. And I understand this is in the 1700s. And, you know, one person would take the metal, pound the metal into the steel, and then, and then, you know, smelt it. And then another person would draw it into the wires, long, 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 thin. Another person would cut it and then twist the ends into the little tab, right? And it was very efficient. And they worked, you know, they had lived in a little hut. You know, every man was maximally employed, you know, to what is the guy making, taking care of the steel, the guy drawing the wires, the guy making the pens. And it was grossly inefficient because they weren't using any kind of mechanization or automation, autom you know, automation in it, which meant that they were producing pens as fast as three people with no more tools than an anvil and some metal snips could produce. And, you know, on one hand, you would you could look at, ah, oh, it's a it's a it's a miracle of efficiency. Everybody is fully doing their thing. But that is like, you know, you have a machine, brothers, because you could sit there and those three guys give him a workshop and, you know, a month or two to think about it could probably build a machine that could produce a thousand times as many pens per day and would lift them up out of their poverty because that was the problem. They were always going to be poor. They could only produce enough pins to basically make it to survive to the next day. And I think about that a lot when, you know, Justin and I ran a business when we're doing, you know, magic DVDs and stuff like this. It was a fine business for a bunch of, you know, a couple of young guys to make money to support ourselves, but like put out a couple of DVDs a year, you know, we were selling some ads on a podcast thing, whatever. But as a thing that scaled or was going to uh, help us escape, you know, middle class, wasn't going to do it. And that's the thing I always think about. Am I building a pen factory? Am I building a thing that my, other than a lottery ticket, I'm not going to build anything that really increases a flywheel that gets way more efficient. And now, now your fear is that you're building a, a pen factory factory where all you are doing is just building more and more tools that just kind of spin your wheels. Well, it's fun because I've got into the addiction of building the tools now because it is it is fun to sort of go down that rabbit hole and say, how do I automate this? How do I automate that? And I have to sort of step back and say, because like, you know, helping my wife build a company and I'm sitting there, I think I sit there, I'll spend a long time like, okay, what do you need to scale? You know, and like, when do you hire? Who do you hire? Like, well, you're going to need to do customer support. Okay, how much can you automate customer support from the very get-go if you know you need to automate this? And how much can you limit the need for customer support Good things are explanatory. How much can you use AI to solve those problems for? Uh, yeah, you know, what's interesting is um, uh, in, in your description of the pin factory story, uh, uh, you, 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 you made the logical next conclusion of automation. It actually wasn't about automation. It was about division of labor. So uh, originally, the, the starting point for the pin manufacturer was one person who did everything in series. And then the conclusion was getting three to five people to to divide the labor and have everyone specialize so you could do uh uh you know 48,000 in the same day this is the the story that uh, was in wealth of nations well yeah but no but the follow up that, that adams made about that was is the idea of when you go through the, the it was that was the inefficiency of it didn't matter you had you had a, you could remark you remarked on look this wonderful division of labor but it was still grossly inefficient because there was no automation uh uh no i i, I believe that was the solution the the inefficient one was one person going in a row the efficient one was division of labor uh, uh at least according to britannica but um uh but but the modern day equivalent would definitely be automation across the board That was, but at the point he was getting at was it was the limitations of specialization to division of labor. That was the, the, if you go further, that's what he got into is that even though you could divide and specialize as much as you could, you were still limited by that. Ah, interesting. So, anyhow, but again, it, the story of the pin factory has been used by different economists and different people have claimed it. And, and uh, Adam's claim to having, you know, have been there, visited there, as people say, like, ah, uh, maybe not so much, but anyhow. Um, Anyhow, uh, point I was trying to make though is 
<laughs> we should think about automation. Um, yeah. So, so uh, one of the questions that we had spoken about a few weeks ago was I was flummoxed by the when to start problem. And your answer was right, right now. Um, and I, I, I sense was wondering, are there projects that you've had to go back and redo because the technology has gotten so much better and how quickly does the iteration happen? Um, you know, like I, I think about like when I have to produce a book, you know, like I don't want, you know, I don't need an AI to write a book for me. And, you know, what I really want is, you know, an AI to take care of all the other problems for me. You know, like I get my book back from my editor and I have to go make these little edits and I have to go work on Microsoft Word, which sucks, you know? And so, you know, my, my thing I think about is kind of going back to the earliest point in a process in two and say, if I did this thing differently, you know, do I even need a tool for it? You know, where, where do I put in tools to do it? So. Uh, uh, <laughs> Uh, I, I guess, uh, uh, yeah, I guess, uh, uh, well, I guess I don't have any questions. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks everybody. <laughs> uh, yeah. Well, I mean, I, 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 I think identifying the problem and figuring out what the product is, is the biggest issue. And, and right now I think the exciting part about where we are is that there are so many different ways that you can go is that oftentimes you can build tools in search of a problem of trying to figure out like, okay, well, can I do a thing and then use that output for something that I want? And the magic sweet spot's going to be where either you or the audience or whoever, whatever you're solving for is truly benefited by something that is that automatable at that quality. Because speed and quality is is what we are dealing with here. And And the more that you can apply that to places that are in need of it, the better off it's going to be, but boy, is it seductive just to figure out like, oh, I got a thing working. And like, and now I can do this thing. It's like, okay, well, how much does this really help? I don't know. Maybe eventually somebody will need the thing I just made. I, you know, find myself stuck in loops. I find myself repeating the same sort of problems I did before. And I find myself, you know, trying to figure out like, what is, what am I really trying to do here? You know, what, what is my kind of goal? Cause I sit down there and I get, I get very much into caught up into, you know, the whole idea of the process over the end result. Uh, uh, like, like how does that feel like in, in concrete terms? Uh, do you have an example? Um, I mean, you know, when, you know, I'm sitting here trying to create like training data, trying to create training data for like, you know, what am I trying to do as far as training data, build a thing? And like, you know, is this, is, am I just doing this because it's a fun problem to solve or am I doing this because the thing that really needs to be solved? Uh, yeah. I mean, I think, I think you're floating in space now in some, you know, a, a, a point between those two ideas. The, the good news is, is that I don't know if there's any lesson that you would learn no matter where you eventually find out that's not going to benefit you going forward because we are, you know, we're, we're in the frontier. Like you can go north, south, east, west. Well, probably not go back to where you came from if we're do, doing a frontier example. So just west, not east. But you can go north, south, or west, and you're going to find something really interesting. And it might not be exactly what the, the most valuable thing is, but boy, are you going to be better for it uh, especially considering like the, the building blocks are moving fast and, and your ability to train a model, your ability to apply it is only going to get more powerful as these, these tools get more and more powerful. Uh, your, your problem or your conundrum reminds me a little bit of something that, uh, Richard Feynman cautioned against in one of his two autobiographies. He, uh, he was kind of mistrustful of computers, not because he didn't love them, but because he loved them too much. And this is back to the punch card days. And it's like uh, he would see other fellow scientists veering away from fundamental works and solving problems because they were, they were increasingly being seduced by all the cool things that they were figuring out that they could do with computers. And so uh, he felt that, uh, that, that siren call and also had a hard time distinguishing uh, uh, what the boundary of productive work versus uh, tinkering was. 
Yeah, and I'm going to apologize to you, Brian, because I'm looking it up, and I'm 100% wrong. Adam Smith clearly used that only as division of, of labor. And <laughs> so it was, It was. I'll give you my side story. It's William Smart, Adam Smith's friend, who then funded James Watt, because William Smart was the one that pointed out, this is the problem, the pin factory did innovation, but you're 100% right on that. So, well, and, and, on uh, air correction. Well, Brian was uh, right, <laughs> Andrew was wrong. Live <laughs> fact checks. Live <laughs> fact checks. I, I, I really didn't want to be that, but I was just like, oh, it's, it's oh, okay, thank you. Uh, uh, it does mention that um, he did refer to it as a machine insofar as each person was an instrumental part of the collective corpus of, of, of a machine, but, uh, uh, yeah. Yeah. And it was Adam Smith invested in the steam engine too, like Adam Smith. And that was the, 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 I think that and my explanation for my, uh, my rudeness towards Brian here was that <laughs> it was that Adam said, I think later may have expressed, but it was not in wealth and nations expressed that there was, that's the problem that it is a dead end because division of labor only takes so far. Wealth of nations, he barely mentions industrialization at all, but he was cognizant of it and did invest in it. But Brian was right. <laughs> well, mm -hmm. it does. It does speak to the kind of constantly shifting goalpost of like like the border is the same. As a matter of fact, it uh, it made me think of how amazing you rightly brought up how crazy it is that helicopters work on Mars. Which I agree, I have the same thought because the air is so thin or whatever, but then also gravity is so low. Like, what are the odds it would be just the right mix that a helicopter would work? But then, but then I thought, uh, wait, probably the amount of atmosphere is directly influenced by the amount of gravity. Uh, so, like, if there's more gravity, you're going to have a thicker atmosphere, so those rotors will still work uh, uh, super well. So it's kind of like a self-correcting equilibrium. And uh, no matter what efficient technologies come along, whether it's the innovation of division of labor, whether it's uh, uh, the industrial revolution of machinery, whether it's artificial intelligence, then there's a new equilibrium of, of uh, you know, fidelity increases. And now we're just more annoyed because it takes 30 seconds for a hologram to download instead of a 4K image, instead of a uh, MP3, instead of a text file. Yeah, I we're on this like a crazy capability right now of what AI can do. And when you think about like what a role or a job would do, like, you know, should you everything's moving fast, knowledge working tasks are moving from our brains to silicon. And when you think about like, I just, I get, I get my, I'm, I'm hung up on this because I started thinking about how do you build for something now knowing how quickly things are going to change. And I think that as I say it aloud, the thing I think about is like, I don't need to build for what's going to be there three years from now. I just need to build smarter than everybody else is. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> what, what is it? Uh, uh, running from a bear to guys like we can't outrun the bears. Like, no, I just got to outrun you. Yeah. 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 Well, also it's, just, it's where the market is, where the people are, what, what, what is the understanding of this and, and what needs to happen for people to step up and interact with it? Like what was the difference in email before a web client, right? Like Hotmail. And then what's the difference in email adoption when Gmail takes away limitations on having to delete things and now everything is available. It's like all of a sudden now these things that were scary become commonplace overnight. And I think a lot of that, you know, is it, it, a lot of things are going to become more commonplace because of AI. I want to, I want to do, let me log in here. I want to give you guys a couple demos here. Um, cool show you a couple states of not my stuff but like uh states of other stuff i'm gonna pull on my github authenticator um where are you um all right <laughs> multi-factor authentication systems that don't work and mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. all right, let me try this again. Sorry. Um, 
You guys are doing a great job of filling the air, by the way. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> well, we don't we don't want to pull the, the, the topic to to a new landscape, but well, uh, but also, we can. Yeah, I didn't know whether or not you were like, oh, let me show you a few demos. I didn't know if you had a ready. Okay. <laughs> no, I'm I'm struggling here. Uh, okay, well, I wonder, here. I'm going to pull up two things. Uh, uh, we'll uh, we'll take this moment to thank everybody who makes sure that After Things continues to be a thing. All of you beautiful, beautiful Patreons uh, at patreon.com slash weirdthings. That's where you already signed up. Thank you. Yeah. Hey, thanks, man. I appreciate that. I appreciate you. <laughs> All right. I'm going to show you. We may have to log in here. Um, I love these demos. Like, ah, oh, just click here to do the thing. And like, no, we actually got to log in. That's not a real input here. Mm -hmm. All right. So I'm going to show you two things. One is um, we've talked about this before. I'm going to show you this again. I'm going to show you two things. One is there is Black Forest is, these are the people that worked on the original, what became st Stable Diffusion uh, and the Stability okay. AI, which basically they were kind of doing their own sort of thing. There's, there's a whole story there. But anyhow, they've come out with their own models, Flux, and this is Flux Schnell, okay? And I'm going to type in my prompt, is making a podcast in a haunted forest, okay? So... This is Flux Schnell. It's a very fast model. They just optimized it to use what's called Go Fast, and they use what's called FPA quantitized, which basically means if you look inside these models, you see a bunch of floating points, you know, point zero 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 is this. And so instead of having them be like, you know, 16, they'll just go to 18. So it's a little bit less precise. So I remember the days of Dolly, first Dolly, and making something Dolly and having to wait for the generation. We're going to run this generation, and it's going to be done in five. Oh, it's already done. Whoa. Wow. 0.8 seconds. Below a neon sign that says weird things. Let's see if it gets that. Pretty close. So, uh, oh, look, it even does point... like the Stranger Things font. Yeah. yeah. 0.9 seconds, like 0.9 seconds to do that, 0.8 seconds, and we got the font right, okay? And this is a strangely... I was about to say, <laughs> podcasters have a type. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So we're at a point where right now to generate an image that would have taken, you know, a minute or so a while ago, this took 0.8 seconds to do this, and the cost per image using Flux Schnell is 0 0.003 cents. So that's 333 images per dollar using the replicate servers if you hosted it yourself it's probably gonna cost one third that you know just crazy and we got pretty good text we got pretty good text so that's cool so you think about that we live in an age where you can just generate images like this on the fly like 0.8 seconds like often faster than you can actually serve it sometimes from pulling it from a bucket now i'm going to show you this is the new leader in really fast inference this is a company called cerebrus and i'm going to say write a podcast segment on using fast AI systems to create podcasts. Okay, mm -hmm. so let me let me share this tab. Okay, so now I'm at Cerebrus Inference. Okay, this is going to use Llama 3.18b, which is a pretty good model, small model, but eight, right? I'm going to click this. You ready? You guys, is anybody ready. got your timer ready? Ready. Ready? What? And this is, they're that, saying that they're getting like 1,800 tokens per second. So they wrote, uh, this was 2,000 tokens per second. 2,000 per second. Okay. We had Grok Cloud, which we talked about before, grok.com, Grok Cloud, which uh, let me try theirs. We'll use the same model. I'm going to just share the window. Um, Which model? I don't know. Um, hmm. That's Grok Cloud. That was really fast too. And um, let me see if I use a full chat. No. Llama 3, similar model. So uh, do they show the token count here anywhere? Anyhow, my point is, is like, oh, that was 1,200 tokens per second. So we're getting 1,200 tokens per second. We're getting 2,000 tokens per second. I mean, it's just absolutely insane that that 
these things are incredibly fast, uh, incredibly cheap now. And to use a really high level, a GPT-4 model, you can use GPT-4 mini, it's like 50 cents you know, you know, per million tokens. And when you can throw a kind of smart high school, you know, high school AP level student at a lot of different tasks, you have to start thinking about where you throw them at those tasks. What, what what is the mechanical method by which it's able to get such astonishing speeds? Um, in the case of Grok, it's basically dividing the process over a bunch of chips, so it's massively parallelizing it. Got it. Um, as a famous economist by the name of Adam Smith. <laughs> well, there's a division of labor that happens. <laughs> no, Brian, no, wrong. I'm going to quote smart and think that I'm quoting Adam Smith and yell at you at it. At it. Um, uh, so, yeah, part of what goes into it is it like they're building their own sort of chips and sort of basically like parallelizing these sorts of things. And so the idea is kind of reducing bottlenecks too. Because if you know that like, you know, as you're processing the information, you're, 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 you do I need, you know, uh, if I have this much bandwidth between my chips, you know, my layers going through there, then I just increase the bandwidth between the chips, mm -hmm. so to speak. So you get rid of the bottlenecks there, et cetera. Not really a helpful answer, I know. Um, oh, no, no, no. I mean, to, to be honest, uh, 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 I was able to grok. Uh, 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 the moment you said massively parallel, uh, it made sense because it truly is astonishing to see that much uh, horsepower Swing, swing around to like we couldn't even be bothered to read all the stuff that's coming out which i think no. speaks to the strange problem that we're going to encounter where it's like now we need readers to read and summarize the reading so that like just well, is it good great <laughs> I, I i actually don't think that it's necessarily like like what what we're looking at there is the ability to create that fast so we don't know what the quality is right but let's assume that it's pretty good uh, but it might not be awesome if you can create that that fast, you can create seven things that fast and then have an AI read the seven and figure out what it believes the best qualities of it are and synthesize that into the one thing that you actually read. If, if, if we're moving that fast, there's so much that you can do that can get you the final product that you want. Yeah. I'll walk you through. So this is the Cerebrus. This is their chip and they compare it to, this is theirs, the WSC3 versus the NVIDIA. H100, which is doing most of that. So chip size is easy. You understand what's the size of the chip, and you can see that their chips are actually these big, gigantic wafers, which are huge. Cores, when we talk about what cores are, those are basically- 900,000 uh, cores. Yeah, that's like a lot of cores, folks. Uh, <laughs> On-chip memory. So basically, instead of putting the memory in a separate unit, they have 44 gigabytes of on-chip memory, where an NVIDIA H100 has 0.05. So that means that it's not having to send things back and forth to it. Now you'll see the memory bandwidth, which is basically how much information it can send between the processor and there, 21 petabits a second, which is 7,000 times more than an H100 could do. And then fabric, fabric is actually a, it's a, it's a framework for transmitting information across chips and stuff. So think of fabric as kind of like a, you know, a protocol for being able to move information across you know, the system. So you look at what they're able to do and basically create a chip that's just so much faster than NVIDIA H100. So that is astonishing. They show, you know, GPU and this, this is a real thing that exists already, not a get ready. That's so bonkers. Yeah. And, you know, what's interesting, the Grok chip, which we talked about before, they said, you know, the term you'll hear is inference. Inference is the actual, when you actually use the AI system to make it calculations and infers, it's called, you know, that's what inference is. And so Grok was like, yeah, we just build chips for doing inference. We're not trying to build chips to do training, right? But the, I wonder if this chip is actually useful for training just because of the structure of it, but that's, that's a, a rabbit hole to dive down some other time, but any event, the idea that we're at this point where imagination is super cheap, AI generative stuff is super cheap, you can go into ChatGPT or Claude and say, help me build a tool to do a thing. You just have to start thinking about, it's, it's, the, it's the iPhone camera problem. Like how long, how long before you realized you had a flashlight and a camera in your pocket at all times? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, uh, the, the concrete example in my life was there was a lot of things that we were 
buying for scam stuff that had flashlights built in. And then one day it was just like, why, why are you, why is there a flashlight? Well, who cares? <laughs> <laughs> Everyone has a flashlight always. Yeah. Yeah. So anyhow, I mean, that's, if I had the time, I'd probably just set up a whole, you know, company to like train people how to train people how to use this stuff yeah but at the very least you can make a new podcast you should automate a way to train people how to train people how to use this stuff well, i thought about that too you know like how much it what level can you automate that like um you know and i can just sit here and think about that all day and not get anything done because that's the story <laughs> of my life <laughs> do you have any picks I, I was actually uh, trying to figure out anything good to, to recommend, and I really don't have much uh, that, that that's new, new. I hear uh, that Beetlejuice I, Beetlejuice is good. I'll go see it. I have a baby pick. So there's a thing called the snoo. It's a bassinet. It costs a lot of money, and thankfully I've been making free content on the Internet for so long that people bought it for us off our registry. <laughs> but uh, it will uh create white noise and slowly rock your child to sleep and boy howdy has it been an absolute game changer when uh you just need to put a little one down oh boy the snoo wow cool um my pick is the snoo yeah, go play a chat GPT. Ask yourself questions. Ask it, hey, how can I automate what I do? Yeah. Uh, I, uh, that that has been a really, really fun game is to uh, now we're just doing the show again. Uh, uh, yeah, keep 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 trying to poke around and see what else you could do with it. It's it's really amazing that we're living through yet another revolution. Yeah. So that's it, everybody. It's been awkward. <laughs> after. got it nailed it look at that we got bandwidth rolling mm, everything yeah. the stream stayed up even says the stream is excellent i think i think that's the uh, judgment on the quality i think so hmm. oh uh okay uh, then in that case, uh, I've got to go. <laughs> I've got to go yell at Shopify, who still is sending people to a IP address with a black mark on it. <laughs> oh yeah, you're still fighting uphill with that. Yeah, uh, like we have now escalated to two people, and I I called the other person, uh, like uh, uh, who's helping me out, uh, Christopher, and I said. Uh, we are a go for all caps. We are a go for all caps. You are authorized to use extreme pettiness in your, if, like, it's it's been weeks of just, like, them uh, just continuing, like, they're closing out the ticket, just saying, do this thing that's not possible. And we keep saying, you have to do it. You and need then, to do the thing. Yeah. Are we still live? Oh, oh, we're, we're still live. I'll shut down the stream. So Talk, long, everybody. Bye, guys. Shopify, pitchfork. <laughs>